Section 31 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Section 31. Adventures of Philip Ashton, who, after escaping from pirates, lived sixteen months in solitude on a desolate island. Part One, On Friday, the 15th of June, 1722, after being out some time in a schooner with four men and a boy off Cape Sable, I stood in for Port Rossaway, designing to lie there all Sunday. Having arrived about four in the afternoon, we saw, among other vessels which had reached the port before us, a brigantine supposed to be inward bound from the West Indies. After remaining three or four hours at anchor, a boat from the brigantine came alongside with four hands, who leapt on deck, and suddenly drawing out pistols and brandishing cutlasses, demanded the surrender both of ourselves and our vessel. All remonstrance was vain, nor indeed had we known who they were before boarding us could we have made any effectual resistance, being only five men and a boy, and were thus under the necessity of submitting at discretion. We were not single in misfortune, as thirteen or fourteen fishing vessels were in like manner surprised the same evening. When carried on board the brigantine, I found myself in the hands of Ned Lowe, an infamous pirate, whose vessel had two great guns, four swivels, and about forty-two men. I was strongly urged to sign the articles of agreement among the pirates and to join their number, which I steadily refused, and suffered much bad usage in consequence. At length being conducted, along with five of the prisoners, to the quarter-deck, Lowe came up to us with pistols in his hand, and loudly demanded, Are any of you married men? This unexpected question, added to the sight of the pistols, struck us all speechless. We were alarmed lest there was some secret meaning in his words, and that he would proceed to extremities, therefore none could reply. In a violent passion he cocked a pistol, and clapping it to my head cried out, You dog, why don't you answer, swearing vehemently at the same time that he would shoot me through the head. I was sufficiently terrified by his threats and fierceness, but rather than lose my life in so trifling a matter I ventured to pronounce, as loud as I durst speak, that I was not married. Hereupon he seemed to be somewhat pacified and turned away. It appeared that Lowe was resolved to take no married men whatever, which often seemed surprising to me until I had been a considerable time with him. But his own wife had died lately before he became a pirate, and he had a young child at Boston for whom he entertained such tenderness, on every lucid interval from drinking and reveling, that on mentioning it I have seen him sit down and weep plentifully. Thus I concluded that his reason for taking only single men was probably that they might have no ties such as wives and children to divert them from his service, and render them desirous of returning home. The pirates, finding force of no avail in compelling us to join them, began to use persuasion instead of it. They tried to flatter me into compliance by setting before me the share I should have in their spoils, and the riches which I should become master of, and all the time eagerly importuned me to drink along with them. But I still continued to resist their proposals, whereupon lo, with equal fury as before, threatened to shoot me through the head, and though I earnestly entreated my release, he and his people wrote my name and that of my companions in their books. On the 19th of June, the pirates changed the privateer, as they called their vessel, and went into a new schooner belonging to Marblehead, which they had captured. They then put all the prisoners whom they designed sending home, on board of the brigantine, and sent her to Boston, which induced me to make another unsuccessful attempt for liberty. But though I fell on my knees to Low, he refused to let me go. Thus I saw the brigantine depart with the whole captives, excepting myself and seven more. Very short time before she departed, I had nearly effected my escape, for a dog belonging to Lowe being accidentally left on shore, he ordered some hands into a boat to bring it off. Thereupon two young men, captives, both belonging to Marblehead, readily leapt into the boat, and I, considering that if I could once get on shore, means might be found of effecting my escape, endeavored to go along with them. 
but the quartermaster, called Russell, catching hold of my shoulder, drew me back. As the young men did not return, he thought I was privy to their plot, and with the most outrageous oaths snapped his pistol, on my denying all knowledge of it. The pistol missing fire, however, only served to enrage him the more. He snapped it three times again, and as often it missed fire, on which he held it overboard, and then it went off. Russell on this drew his cutlass and was about to attack me in the utmost fury when I leapt down into the hold and saved myself. Off St. Michael's the pirates took a large Portuguese pink, laden with wheat, coming out of the road, and being a good sailor and carrying fourteen guns, transferred their company into her. It afterwards became necessary to careen her, whence they made three islands called Triangles, lying about forty degrees to the eastward of Suriname. In heaving down the pink, Low had ordered so many men to the shrouds and yards that the ports by her heeling got under water, and the sea rushing in she overset. He and the doctor were then in the cabin, and as soon as he observed the water rushing in, he leaped out of the stern port while the doctor attempted to follow him. But the violence of the sea repulsed the latter, and he was forced back into the cabin. Low, however, contrived to thrust his arm into the port, and dragging him out saved his life. Meanwhile the vessel completely overset, her keel turned out of the water, but as the hull lifted she sunk in the depth of about six fathoms. The yard-arm striking the ground forced the mast somewhat above the water. As the ship overset the people got from the shrouds and yards upon the hull, and as the hull went down they again resorted to the rigging, rising a little out of the sea. Being an indifferent swimmer, I was reduced to great extremity, for along with other light lads I had been sent up to the main top gallant yard, and the people of a boat, who were now occupied in preserving the men, refusing to take me in, I was compelled to attempt reaching the boy. This I luckily accomplished, and as it was large, secured myself there until the boat approached. I once more requested the people to take me in, but they still refused, as the boat was full. I was uncertain whether they designed leaving me to perish in this situation. However, the boat being deeply laden, made way very slowly, and one of my comrades captured at the same time with myself, calling to me to forsake the boy and swim towards her, I assented, and reaching the boat he drew me on board. Two men, John Bell and Zena Gordon, were lost in the pink. Though the schooner in company was very near at hand, her people were employed mending their sails under an awning, and knew nothing of the accident until the boat full of men got alongside. The pirates having thus lost their principal vessel, and the greatest part of their provisions and water were reduced to great extremities for want of the latter. They were unable to get a supply at the triangles, nor on account of calms and currents could they make the island of Tobago. Thus they were forced to stand for Grenada, which they reached after being on short allowance for sixteen days together. Grenada was a French settlement, and Lo, on arriving, after having sent all his men except a sufficient number to maneuver the vessel below, said he was from Barbados, that he had lost the water on board, and he was obliged to put in here for a supply. The people entertained no suspicion of his being a pirate, but afterwards, supposing him a smuggler, thought it a good opportunity to make a prize of his vessel. Next day, therefore, they equipped a large sloop of seventy tons and four guns, with about thirty hands, as sufficient for the capture, and came alongside while Lowe was quite unsuspicious of their design. But this being evidently betrayed by their number and actions, he quickly called ninety men on deck, and having eight guns mounted, the French sloop became an easy prey. Provided with these two vessels, the pirates cruised about in the West Indies, taking seven or eight prizes, and at length arrived at the island of Santa Cruz, where they captured two more. While lying there, Lowe thought he stood in need of a medicine chest, and in order to procure one, sent four Frenchmen in a vessel he had taken, to St. Thomas's, about twelve leagues distant, with money to purchase it, promising them liberty and the return of all their vessels for the service but he declared at the same time, if it proved otherwise, he would kill the rest of the men and burn the vessels. In little more than twenty-four hours the Frenchmen returned with the object of their mission, and Lowe punctually performed his promise by restoring the vessels. Having sailed for the Spanish-American settlements, 
the pirates decried two large ships about halfway between Carthagena and Portobello, which proved to be the Mermaid, an English man-of-war, and a Guinea man. They approached in chase until discovering the man-of-war's great range of teeth, when they immediately put about and made the best of their way off. The man-of-war then commenced the pursuit, and gained upon them apace, and I confess that my terrors were now equal to any that I had previously suffered, for I concluded that we should certainly be taken, and that I should no less certainly be hanged for company's sake. So true are the words of Solomon, A companion of fools shall be destroyed. But the two pirate vessels finding themselves out sailed, separated, and Farrington Spriggs, who commanded the schooner in which I was, stood in for the shore. The mermaid, observing the sloop with Low himself to be the larger of the two, crowded all sail and continued gaining still more, indeed until her shot flew over. But one of the sloop's crew showed Low a shoal, which he could pass, and in the pursuit the man-of-war grounded. Thus the pirates escaped hanging on this occasion. Spriggs and one of his chosen companions, dreading the consequences of being captured and brought to justice, laid their pistols beside them in the interval, and pledging a mutual oath and a bumper of liquor, swore, if they saw no possibility of escape, to set foot to foot and blow out each other's brains. But standing towards the shore they made Picaroon Bay and escaped the danger. Next we repaired to a small island called Utilla about seven or eight leagues to the leeward of the island of Roatan in the Bay of Honduras, where the bottom of the schooner was cleaned. There were now twenty-two persons on board, and eight of us engaged in a plot to overpower our masters and make our escape. Spriggs proposed sailing for New England in quest of provisions, and to increase his company, and we intended on approaching the coast, when the rest had indulged freely in liquor and had fallen sound asleep, to secure them under the hatches, and then deliver ourselves up to government. Although our plot was carried on with all possible privacy, Spriggs had somehow or another got intelligence of it, and having fallen in with Low on the voyage, went on board his ship to make a furious declaration against us. But Low made little account of his information, otherwise it might have been fatal to most of our number. Spriggs, however, returned raging to the schooner, exclaiming that four of us should go forward to be shot, and to me in particular he said, You dog, Ashton, you deserve to be hanged up at the yardarm for designing to cut us off. I replied that I had no intention of injuring any man on board, but I should be glad if they would allow me to go away quietly. At length this flame was quenched, and through the goodness of God I escaped destruction. Roatan Harbor as all about the Bay of Honduras, is full of small islands which pass under the general name of Keys. And having got in here, Lo, with some of his chief men, landed on a small island which they called Port Royal Key. There they erected huts, and continued carousing, drinking, and firing while the different vessels of which they now had possession were repairing. On Saturday the ninth of March, 1723, the cooper with six hands in the longboat was going ashore for water, and coming alongside of the schooner I requested to be of the party. Seeing him hesitate I urged that I had never hitherto been ashore, and thought it hard to be so closely confined when every one besides had the liberty of landing as there was no occasion, Low had before told me, on requesting to be sent away in some of the captured vessels which he dismissed, that I should go home when he did and swore that I should never previously set my foot on land. But now I considered if I could possibly once get on terra firma, though in ever such bad circumstances I should account it a happy deliverance, and resolve never to embark again. The cooper at length took me into the longboat, while Low and his chief people were on a different island from Roatan, where the watering place lay. My only clothing was an Osnaburg frock and trousers, a milled cap, but neither shirt, shoes, stockings, nor anything else. When we first landed I was very active in assisting to get the casks out of the boat, and enrolling them to the watering place. Then taking a hearty draught of water, I strolled along the beach, picking up stones and shells. But on reaching the distance of a musket shot from the party, I began to withdraw toward the skirts of the woods. In answer to a question by the cooper of whither I was going, I replied, For coconuts as some coca trees were just before me. 
and as soon as I was out of sight of my companions, I took to my heels, running as fast as the thickness of the bushes and my naked feet would admit. Notwithstanding, I had got a considerable way into the woods, I was still so near as to hear the voices of the party if they spoke loud, and I lay close in a thicket where I knew they could not find me. After my comrades had filled their casks and were about to depart, the cooper called on me to accompany them. However, I lay snug in the thicket and gave him no answer, though his words were plain enough. At length, after hallowing loudly, I could hear them say to one another, The dog is lost in the woods and cannot find the way out again. Then they hallowed once more and cried, He has run away and won't come to us. And the cooper observed that had he known my intention he would not have brought me ashore. Satisfied of their inability to find me among the trees and bushes, the cooper at last, to show his kindness, exclaimed, If you do not come away presently, I shall go off and leave you alone. Nothing, however, could induce me to discover myself, and my comrades, seeing it vain to wait any longer, put off without me. Thus I was left on a desolate island, destitute of all help and remote from the track of navigators, but compared with the state and society I had quitted, I considered the wilderness hospitable and the solitude interesting. When I thought the whole were gone, I emerged from my thicket and came down to a small run of water, about a mile from the place where our casks were filled, and there sat down to observe the proceedings of the pirates. To my great joy, in five days their vessels sailed, and I saw the schooner part from them to shape a different course. I then began to reflect on myself and my present condition. I was on an island which I had no means of leaving. I knew of no human being within many miles. My clothing was scanty, and it was impossible to procure a supply. I was altogether destitute of provision, nor could tell how my life was to be supported. This melancholy prospect drew a copious flood of tears from my eyes. But as it had pleased God to grant my wishes in being liberated from those whose occupation was devising mischief against their neighbors, I resolved to account every hardship light. Yet Low would never suffer his men to work on the Sabbath, which was more devoted to play, and I have even seen some of them sit down to read in a good book. In order to ascertain how I was to live in time to come, I began to range over the island, which proved ten or twelve leagues long and lay in about sixteen degrees north latitude. But I soon found that my only companions would be the beasts of the earth, and fowls of the air, for there were no indications of any habitations on the island, though every now and then I found some shreds of earthenware scattered in a lime walk, said by some to be the remains of Indians formerly dwelling here. The island was well watered, full of high hills and deep valleys. Numerous fruit trees such as figs, vines, and coconuts are found in the latter, and I found a kind larger than an orange, oval-shaped and of a brownish color without, and red within. Though many of these had fallen under the trees, I could not venture to take them until I saw the wild hogs feeding with safety, and then I found them very delicious fruit. Stores of provisions abounded here, though I could avail myself of nothing but the fruit, for I had no knife or iron implement, either to cut up a tortoise on turning it, or weapons wherewith to kill animals, nor had I any means of making a fire to cook my capture even if I were successful. Sometimes I entertained thoughts of digging pits, and covering them over with small branches of trees, for the purpose of taking hogs or deer. But I wanted a shovel and every substitute for the purpose, and I was soon convinced that my hands were insufficient to make a cavity deep enough to retain what it should fall into. Thus I was forced to rest satisfied with fruit, which was to be esteemed very good provision for any one in my condition. In the process of time, while poking among the sand with a stick, in quest of tortoise eggs which I had heard were laid in the sand, part of one came up adhering to it, and on removing the sand I found nearly an hundred and fifty, which had not lain long enough to spoil. Therefore taking some, I ate them, and strung others on a strip of palmetto, which being hung up in the sun became thick and somewhat hard, so they were more palatable. After all, they were not very savory food, though one who had nothing but what fell from the trees behooved to be content. 
Tortoises lay their eggs in the sand, in holes about a foot or a foot and a half deep, and smooth the surface over them so there is no discovering where they lay. According to the best of my observation, the young are hatched in eighteen or twenty days, and then immediately take to the water. Many serpents are on this and the adjacent islands. One about twelve or fourteen feet long is as large as a man's waist, but not poisonous. When lying at length they look like old trunks of trees, covered with short moss, though they usually assume a circular position. The first time I saw one of these serpents I had approached very near before discovering it to be a living creature. It opened its mouth wide enough to have received a hat, and breathed on me. A small black fly creates such annoyance that even if a person possessed ever so many comforts, his life would be oppressive to him, unless for the possibility of retiring to some small key, destitute of wind and bushes, where multitudes are dispersed by the wind. To this place, then, I was confined during nine months without seeing a human being. One day after another was lingering out, I know not how void of occupation or amusement except collecting food, rambling from hill to hill, and from island to island, and gazing on sky and water. Although my mind was occupied by many regrets, I had the reflection that I was lawfully employed when taken, so that I had no hand in bringing misery on myself. I was also comforted to think that I had the approbation and consent of my parents in going to sea and trusted that it would please God in his own time and manner to provide for my return to my father's house. Therefore I resolved to submit patiently to my misfortune. It was my daily practice to ramble from one part of the island to another, though I had a more special home near the waterside. Here I built a hut to defend me against the heat of the sun by day and the heavy dews by night. Taking some of the best branches which I could find fallen from the trees, I contrived to fix them against a low-hanging bough, by fastening them together with split palmetto leaves. Next I covered the whole with some of the largest and most suitable leaves that I could get. Many of these huts were constructed by me, generally near the beach with the open part, fronting the sea, to have the better lookout and advantage of the sea breeze, which both the heat and the vermin required. But the insects were so troublesome that I thought of endeavouring to get over to some of the adjacent keys, in hopes of enjoying rest. However, I was, as already said, a very indifferent swimmer. I had no canoe, nor any means of making one. At length, having got a piece of bamboo which is hollow like a reed and light as a cork, I ventured, after frequent trials with it under my breast and arms, to put off for a small key about a gunshot distant, which I reached in safety. My new place of refuge was only about three or four hundred feet in circuit, lying very low and clear of woods and brush. From exposure to the wind it was quite free of vermin, and I seemed to have got into a new world, where I lived infinitely more at ease. Hither I retired, therefore, when the heat of the day rendered the insect tribe most obnoxious. Yet I was obliged to be much on Roatan, to procure food and water, and at night on account of my hut. When swimming back and forward between the two islands, I used to bind my frock and trousers about my head, and, if I could have carried over wood and leaves whereof to make a hut with equal facility, I should have passed more of my time on the smaller one. Yet these excursions were not unattended with danger. Once I remember when passing from the larger island, the bamboo, before I was aware, slipped from under me and the tide or current set down so strong that it was with great difficulty I could reach the shore. At another time, when swimming over to the small island, a shovel-nosed shark, which as well as alligators abound in those seas, struck me in the thigh, just as my foot could reach the bottom, and grounded itself, from the shallowness of the water as I suppose, so that its mouth could not get round towards me. The blow I felt some hours after making the shore. By repeated practice I at length became a pretty dexterous swimmer, and amused myself by passing from one island to another among the keys. I suffered very much from being barefoot. So many deep wounds were made in my feet from traversing the woods, where the ground was covered with sticks and stones, and on the hot beach over sharp broken shells, that I was scarce able to walk at all. 
often when treading with all possible caution a stone or shell on the beach or a pointed stick in the woods would penetrate the old wound and the extreme anguish would strike me down as suddenly as if i had been shot then i would remain for hours together with tears gushing from my eyes from the acuteness of the pain i could travel no more than absolute necessity compelled me in quest of subsistence and i have sat my back leaning against a tree looking out for a vessel during a complete day once while faint from such injuries as well as smarting under the pain of them a wild boar rushed towards me i knew not what to do for i had not strength to resist his attack therefore as he drew nearer i caught the bough of a tree and suspended myself by means of it the boar tore away part of my ragged trousers with his tusks and then left me this i think was the only time that i was attacked by any wild beast and i considered myself to have had a very great deliverance as my weakness continued to increase i often fell to the ground insensible and then as also when i laid myself to sleep i thought i should never wake again or rise in life under this affliction i first lost count of the days of the week i could not distinguish sunday and as my illness became more and more aggravated i became ignorant of the month also all this time i had no healing balsam for my feet nor any cordial to revive my drooping spirits my utmost efforts could only now and then procure some figs and grapes neither had i fire for though i had heard of a way to procure it by rubbing two sticks together my attempts in this respect continued until i was tired proved abortive the rains having come on attended with chill winds i suffered exceedingly end of chapter thirty one recording by philip gould Section 32 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter 32. Adventures of Philip Ashton, who, after escaping from pirates, lived sixteen months in solitude on a desolate island. Part two. While passing nine months in this lonely, melancholy, and irksome condition, my thoughts would sometimes wander to my parents, and I reflected that, notwithstanding it would be consolatory to myself if they knew where I was, it might be distressing to them. The nearer my prospect of death, which I often expected, the greater my penitence became. Sometime in November 1723 I decried a small canoe approaching with a single man, but the sight excited little emotion. I kept my seat on the beach, thinking I could not expect a friend, and knowing that I had no enemy to fear, nor was I capable of resisting one. As the man approached, he betrayed many signs of surprise. He called me to him, and I told him he might safely venture ashore, for I was alone and almost expiring. Coming close up, he knew not what to make of me. My garb and countenance seemed so singular that he looked wild with astonishment. He started back a little, and surveyed me more thoroughly, but recovering himself again came forward, and taking me by the hand, expressed his satisfaction at seeing me. This stranger proved to be a native of North Britain. He was well advanced in years, of a grave and venerable aspect, and of a reserved temper. His name I never knew. He did not disclose it, and I had not inquired during the period of our acquaintance. But he informed me he had lived twenty-two years with the Spaniards who now threatened to burn him, though I know not for what crime. Therefore he had fled hither as a sanctuary, bringing his dog, gun, and ammunition, as also a small quantity of pork along with him. He designed spending the remainder of his days on the island where he could support himself by hunting. I experienced much kindness from the stranger. He was always ready to perform any civil offices and assist me in whatever he could, though he spoke little, and he gave me a share of his pork. On the third day after his arrival, he said he would make an excursion in his canoe among the neighboring islands for the purpose of killing wild hogs and deer, and wished me to accompany him. 
though my spirits were somewhat recruited by his society the benefit of the fire which i now enjoyed and dressed provisions my weakness and the soreness of my feet precluded me therefore he set out alone saying he would return in a few hours the sky was serene and there was no prospect of any danger during a short excursion seeing he had come nearly twelve leagues in safety in his canoe but when he had been absent about an hour a violent gust of wind and rain arose in which he probably perished as i never heard of him more thus after having the pleasure of a companion almost three days i was as unexpectedly reduced to my former lonely state as i had been relieved from it yet through the goodness of god i was myself preserved from having been unable to accompany him and i was left in better circumstances than those in which he had found me for now i had about five pounds of pork a knife a bottle of gunpowder tobacco tongs and flint by which means my life could be rendered more comfortable i was enabled to have fire extremely requisite at this time being the rainy months of winter i could cut up a tortoise and have a delicate broiled meal thus by the help of the fire and dressed provisions through the blessings of god i began to recover strength though the soreness of my feet remained but i had besides the advantage of being able now and then to catch a dish of crayfish which when roasted proved good eating to accomplish this i made up a small bundle of old broken sticks nearly resembling pitch pine or candle wood and having lighted one end waited with it in my hand up to the waist in water the crayfish attracted by the light would crawl to my feet and lie directly under it when by means of a forked stick i could toss them ashore between two and three months after the time of losing my companion i found a small canoe while ranging along the shore the sight of it revived my regret for his loss for i judged that it had been his canoe and from being washed up here a certain proof of his having been lost in the tempest but on examining it more closely i satisfied myself that it was one which i had never seen before master of this little vessel i began to think myself admiral of the neighboring seas as well as sole possessor and chief commander of the islands profiting by its use i could transport myself to the places of retreat more conveniently than by my former expedient of swimming in process of time i projected an excursion to some of the larger and more distant islands partly to learn how they were stored or inhabited and partly for the sake of amusement laying in a small stock of figs and grapes therefore as also some tortoise to eat and carrying my implements for fire i put off to steer for the island of bornaco which is about four or five leagues long and situated five or six from roatan in the course of the voyage observing a sloop at the east end of the island i made the best of my way to the west designing to travel down by land both because a point of rocks ran far into the sea beyond which i did not care to venture in the canoe as was necessary to come ahead of the sloop and because i wished to ascertain something concerning her people before i was discovered even in my worst circumstances i never could brook the thoughts of returning on board of any piratical vessel and resolved rather to live and die in my present situation hauling up the canoe and making it fast as well as i was able i set out on the journey my feet were yet in such a state that two days and the best part of two nights were occupied in it sometimes the woods and bushes were so thick that it was necessary to crawl half a mile together on my hands and knees which rendered my progress very slow when within a mile or two of the place where i supposed the sloop might be i made for the water side and approached the sea gradually that i might not too soon disclose myself to view however on reaching the beach there was no appearance of the sloop whence i judged that she had sailed during the time spent by me in travelling being much fatigued with the journey i rested myself against the stump of a tree with my face towards the sea where sleep overpowered me but i had not slumbered long before i was suddenly awakened by the noise of firing Starting up in a fright, I saw nine periaguas, or large canoes, full of men, firing upon me from the sea, whence I soon turned about and ran amongst the bushes as fast as my sore feet would allow, while the men who were Spaniards cried after me, O oh, Englishmen, we will give you good quarter. However, my astonishment was so great, 
and I was so suddenly roused from my sleep that I had no self-command to listen to their offers of quarter, which it may be at another time, in my cooler moments, I might have done. Thus I made into the woods, and the strangers continued firing after me to the number of a hundred and fifty bullets at least, many of which cut small twigs off the bushes close by my side. Having gained an extensive thicket beyond reach of the shot, I lay close several hours until observing, by the sound of their oars, that the Spaniards were departing. I crept out. I saw the sloop under English colors sailing away with the canoes in tow, which induced me to suppose she was an English vessel which had been at the Bay of Honduras and taken there by the Spaniards. Next day I returned to the tree where I had been so nearly surprised, and was astonished to find six or seven shot in the trunk within a foot or less of my head. Yet through the wonderful goodness of God, though having been as a mark to shoot at, I was preserved. After this I travelled to recover my canoe at the western end of the island, which I reached in three days, but suffering severely from the soreness of my feet and the scantiness of provisions. This island is not so plentifully stored as Roatan, so that during the five or six days of my residence I had difficulty in procuring subsistence, and the insects were, besides, infinitely more numerous and harassing than at my old habitation. These circumstances deterred me from further exploring the island, and having reached the canoe very tired and exhausted, I put off for Roatan, which was a royal palace to me compared with Bonaco, and arrived at night in safety. Here I lived, if it may be called living, alone for about seven months after losing my North British companion. My time was spent in the usual manner, hunting for food and ranging among the islands. Sometime in June 1724, while on the small quay, whither I often retreated to be free from the annoyance of insects, I saw two canoes making for the harbour. Approaching nearer, they observed the smoke of a fire which I had kindled, and at a loss to know what it meant, they hesitated on advancing. What I had experienced at Bonaco was still fresh in my own memory, and loath to run the risk of such another firing, I withdrew to my canoe, lying behind the quay, not above one hundred yards distance, and immediately rowed over to Roatan. There I had places of safety against an enemy, and sufficient accommodation for any ordinary number of friends. The people in the canoes observed me cross the sea to Roatan, the passage not exceeding a gunshot over, and being as much afraid of pirates as I was of Spaniards, approached very cautiously towards the shore. I then came down to the beach, showing myself openly, for their conduct led me to think that they could not be pirates, and I resolved before being exposed to the danger of their shot to inquire who they were. If they proved such as I did not like, I could easily retire. But before I spoke, they, as full of apprehension as I could be, lay on their oars and demanded who I was, and from whence I came. To which I replied that I was an Englishman, and had run away from pirates. On this they drew somewhat nearer, inquiring who was there besides myself, when I assured them in return that I was alone. Next, according to my original purpose, Having put similar questions to them, they said they had come from the Bay of Honduras. Their words encouraged me to bid them row ashore, which they accordingly did, though at some distance, and one man landed, whom I advanced to meet. But he started back at the sight of a poor, ragged, wild, forlorn, miserable object so near him. Collecting himself, however, he took me by the hand, and we began embracing each other he from surprise and wonder, and I from a sort of ecstasy of joy. When this was over, he took me in his arms and carried me down to the canoes, when all his comrades were struck with astonishment at my appearance. But they gladly received me, and I experienced great tenderness from them. I gave the strangers a brief account of my escape from Low, and my lonely residence for sixteen months, all excepting three days, the hardships I had suffered, and the dangers to which I had been exposed. They stood amazed at the recital. They wondered I was alive, and expressed much satisfaction at being able to relieve me. Observing me very weak and depressed, they gave me about a spoonful of rum to recruit my fainting spirits. 
but even this small quantity, from my long disuse of strong liquors, threw me into violent agitation, and produced a kind of stupor, which at last ended in privation of sense. Some of the party, perceiving a state of insensibility come on, would have administered more rum, which those better skilled among them prevented, and after lying a short time in a fit, I revived. Then I ascertained that the strangers were eighteen in number, the chief of them named John Hope, an old man called Father Hope by his companions, and John Ford, and all belonging to the Bay of Honduras. The cause of their coming hither was an alarm for an attack from the sea by the Spaniards, while the Indians should make a descent by land and cut off the bay. Thus they had fled for safety. On a former occasion the two persons above named had, for the like reason, taken shelter among these islands, and lived four years at a time on a small one named Barbarat, about two leagues from Roatan. There they had two plantations, as they called them, and now they brought two barrels of flour with other provisions, firearms, dogs for hunting and nets for tortoises, and also an Indian woman to dress their provisions. Their principal residence was a small quay, about a quarter of a mile round, lying near to Barbarat, and named by them the Castle of Comfort, chiefly because it was low and clear of woods and bushes, so that the free circulation of wind could drive away the pestiferous mosquitoes and other insects. From hence they sent to the surrounding islands for wood, water, and materials to build two houses, such as they were, for shelter. I now had the prospect of a much more agreeable life than what I had spent during the sixteen months past, for besides having company, the strangers treated me with a great deal of civility in their way. They clothed me, and gave me a large wrapping gown as a defense against the nightly dews until their houses were erected, and there was plenty of provisions. Yet, after all, they were bad society, and as to their common conversation there was but little difference between them and pirates. However, it did not appear that they were now engaged in any such evil design as rendered it unlawful to join them, or be found in their company. In process of time, and with the assistance afforded by my companions, I gathered so much strength as sometimes to be able to hunt along with them. The islands abounded with wild hogs, deer, and tortoise, and different ones were visited in quest of game. This was brought home where instead of being immediately consumed, it was hung up to dry and smoke, so as to be a ready supply at all times. I now considered myself beyond the reach of danger from an enemy, for independent of supposing that nothing could bring any one here, I was surrounded by a number of men with arms constantly in their hands. Yet at the very time that I thought myself most secure, I was very nearly again falling into the hands of pirates. Six or seven months after the strangers joined me, three of them, along with myself, took a four-oared canoe for the purpose of hunting and killing tortoise on Bonaco. During our absence, the rest repaired their canoes and prepared to go over to the Bay of Honduras to examine how matters stood there and bring off their remaining effects, in case it were dangerous to return. But before they had departed, we were on our voyage homewards, having a full load of pork and tortoise, as our object was successfully accomplished. While entering the mouth of the harbor, in a moonlight evening, we saw a great flash and heard a report much louder than that of a musket proceed from a large periagua, which we observed near the Castle of Comfort. This put us in extreme consternation, and we knew not what to consider, but in a minute we heard a volley from eighteen or twenty small arms discharged towards the shore, and also some returned from it. Satisfied that an enemy, either Spaniards or pirates, was attacking our people, and being intercepted from them by periaguas lying between us and the shore, we thought the safest plan was trying to escape. Therefore, taking down our little mast and sail that they might not betray us, we rowed out of the harbor as fast as possible towards an island about a mile and a half distant to retreat undiscovered. But the enemy, either having seen us before lowering our sail, or heard the noise of the oars, followed with all speed in an eight or ten oared periagua. Observing her approach and fast gaining on us, we rowed with all our might to make the nearest shore. However, she was at length enabled to discharge a swivel, the shot from which passed over our canoe. 
Nevertheless, we contrived to reach the shore before being completely within the range of small arms which our pursuers discharged on us while landing. They were now near enough to cry aloud that they were pirates and not Spaniards, and that we need not dread them as we should get good quarter, then supposing that we should be the easier induced to surrender. Yet nothing could have been said to discourage me more from putting myself in their power. I had the utmost dread of a pirate, and my original aversion was now enhanced by the apprehension of being sacrificed for my former desertion. Thus concluding to keep as clear of them as I could, and the Honduras Bay men having no great inclination to do otherwise, we made the best of our way to the woods. Our pursuers carried off the canoe with all its contents, resolving, if we would not go to them, to deprive us, as far as possible, of all means of subsistence where we were. But it gave me, who had known both want and solitude, little concern now that I had company, and there were arms among us to procure provision, and also fire wherewith to dress it. Our assailants were some men belonging to Spriggs, my former commander, who had thrown off his allegiance to Lowe and set up for himself at the head of a gang of pirates, with a good ship of twenty-four guns and a sloop of twelve, both presently lying in Roatan Harbor. He had put in for fresh water and to refit at the place where I first escaped, and having discovered my companions at the small island of their retreat, sent a periagua full of men to take them. Accordingly they carried all ashore, as also a child and an Indian woman, the last of whom they shamefully abused. They killed a man after landing and throwing him into one of the canoes containing tar, set it on fire and burnt his body in it. Then they carried the people on board of their vessels where they were barbarously treated. One of them turned pirate, however, and told the others that John Hope had hid many things in the woods. Therefore they beat him unmercifully to make him disclose his treasure, which they carried off with him. After the pirates had kept these people five days on board of their vessels, they gave them a flat of five or six tons to carry them to the Bay of Honduras, but no kind of provision for the voyage, and further before dismissal compelled them to swear that they would not come near me and my party who had escaped to another island. While the vessels rode in the harbor we kept a good lookout, but were exposed to some difficulties from not daring to kindle a fire to dress our victuals, lest our residence should be betrayed. Thus we lived for five days on raw provisions. As soon as they sailed, however, Hope, little regarding the oath extorted from him, came and informed us of what had passed, and I could not for my own part be sufficiently grateful to Providence for escaping the hands of the pirates, who would have put me to a cruel death. Hope and all his people, except John Simons, now resolved to make their way to the bay. Simons, who had a negro, wished to remain some time for the purpose of trading with the Jamaica men on the main. But thinking my best chance of getting to New England was from the Bay of Honduras, I requested Hope to take me with him. The old man, though he would gladly have done so, advanced many objections, such as the insufficiency of the flat to carry so many men seventy leagues, that they had no provision for the passage which might be tedious, and the flat was, besides, ill calculated to stand the sea, as also that it was uncertain how matters might turn out at the bay. Thus he thought it better for me to remain, yet rather than I should be in solitude he would take me in. Simons, on the other hand, urged me to stay and bear him company, and gave several reasons why I should more likely obtain a passage from the Jamaica men to New England than by the Bay of Honduras. As this seemed a fairer prospect of reaching my home, which I was extremely anxious to do, I assented and having thanked Hope and his companions for their civilities, I took leave of them, and they departed. Simons was provided with a canoe, firearms, and two dogs in addition to his negro, by which means he felt confident of being able to provide all that was necessary for our subsistence. We spent two or three months after the usual manner, ranging from island to island, but the prevalence of the winter rains precluded us from obtaining more game than we required. When the season for the Jamaica traders approached, Simons proposed repairing to some other island to obtain a quantity of tortoise shell, which he could exchange for clothes and shoes, and being successful in this respect, we next proceeded to Bonaco, 
which lies nearer the main, that we might thence take a favourable opportunity to run over. Having been a short time at Bonaco, a furious tempest arose and continued for three days, when we saw several vessels standing in for the harbour. The largest of them anchored at a great distance, but a brigantine came over the shoals opposite to the watering-place, and sent her boat ashore with casks. Recognizing three people who were in the boat, their dress and appearance for Englishmen, I concluded they were friends, and showed myself openly on the beach before them. They ceased rowing immediately on observing me, and after answering their inquiries of who I was I put the same questions, saying they might come ashore with safety. They did so, and a happy meeting it was for me. I now found that the vessels were a fleet under convoy of the Diamond Man of War, bound for Jamaica, but many ships had parted company in the storm. The Diamond had sent in the Brigantine to get water here as the sickness of her crew had occasioned a great consumption of that necessary article. Simons, who had kept at a distance, lest the three men might hesitate to come ashore, at length approached to participate in my joy, though at the same time testifying considerable reluctance at the prospect of my leaving him. The brigantine was commanded by Captain Dove, with whom I was acquainted, and she belonged to Salem within three miles of my father's house. Captain Dove not only treated me with great civility, and engaged to give me a passage home, but took me in to pay, having lost a seaman, whose place he wanted me to supply. Next day the Diamond having sent her longboat with casks for water, they were filled, and after taking leave of Simons, who shed tears at parting, I was carried on board of the Brigantine. We sailed along with the Diamond, which was bound for Jamaica on the latter end of March, 1725, and kept company until the 1st of April. By the providence of heaven we passed safely through the Gulf of Florida, and reached Salem Harbor on the 1st of May, two years, ten months, and fifteen days after I was first taken by pirates, and two years and two months after making my escape from them on Roatan Island. That same evening I went to my father's house, where I was received as one risen from the dead. End of section 32 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 33 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter 33 Explosion of His Britannic Majesty's Ship Amphion. The Amphion frigate, Captain Israel Pello, after having cruised some time in the North Seas, had at length received an order to join the squadron of frigates commanded by sir edward pello she was on her passage when a hard gale of wind occasioning some injury to the foremast obliged her to put back into plymouth off which place she then was she accordingly came into the sound anchored there on the nineteenth and went up into harbour the next morning on the twenty second at about half past four p m a violent shock as of an earthquake was felt at stone house and extended as far off as the royal hospital and the town of plymouth the sky towards the dock appeared red like the effect of a fire for near a quarter of an hour the cause of this appearance could not be ascertained though the streets were crowded with people running different ways in the utmost consternation when the alarm and confusion had somewhat subsided it first began to be known that the shock had been occasioned by the explosion of the amphion several bodies and mangled remains were picked up by the boats in hamoes and their alacrity on this occasion was particularly remarked and highly commended the few who remained alive of the crew were conveyed in a mangled state to the royal hospital as the frigate was originally manned from plymouth the friends and relations of her unfortunate ship's company mostly lived in the neighbourhood. It is dreadful to relate what a scene took place. Arms, legs, and lifeless trunks, mangled and disfigured by gunpowder, were collected and deposited at the hospital, having been brought in sacks to be owned. 
bodies still living some with the loss of limbs others having expired as they were being conveyed thither men women and children whose sons husbands and fathers were among the unhappy number flocking round the gates entreating admittance during the first evening nothing was ascertained concerning the cause of this event though numerous reports were instantly circulated the few survivors who by the following day had in some degree regained the use of their senses could not give the least account one man who was brought alive to the royal hospital died before night another before the following morning the boatswain and one of the sailors appeared likely with great care to do well three or four men who were at work in the tops were blown up with them and falling into the water were picked up with very little hurt these with the two before mentioned and one of the sailors wives were supposed to be the only survivors besides the captain and two of the lieutenants the following particulars were however collected from the examination of several persons before sir richard king the post admiral and the information procured from those who saw the explosion from the dock the first person known to have observed anything was a young midshipman in the cambridge guardship lying not far distant from the place where the amphion blew up who having a great desire to observe everything relative to a profession into which he had just entered was looking through a glass at the frigate as she lay alongside of the sheer hulk and was taking in her bowsprit she was lashed to the hulk and the yarmouth an old receiving ship was lying on the opposite side quite close to her and both within a few yards of the dockyard jetty the midshipman said that the amphion suddenly appeared to rise altogether upright from the surface of the water until he nearly saw her keel the explosion then succeeded the mast seemed to be forced up into the air and the hull instantly to sink all this passed in the space of two minutes the man who stood at the dockyard stairs said that the first he heard of it was a kind of hissing noise and then followed the explosion when he beheld the masts blow up into the air it was very strongly reported that several windows were broken in the dock by the explosion and that in the dockyard much mischief was done by the amphion's guns going off when she blew up but though the shock was felt as far off as plymouth and at stone house enough to shake the windows yet it is a wonderful and miraculous fact that surrounded as she was in the harbour with ships close alongside of the jetty and lashed to another vessel no damage was done to anything but herself it is dreadful to reflect that owing to their intention of putting to sea the next day there were nearly one hundred men women and children more than her complement on board taking leave of their friends besides the company who were at two dinners given in the ship one of which was by the captain captain israel pellow and captain william swaffield of his majesty's ship overysel who was at dinner with him and the first lieutenant were drinking their wine when the first explosion threw them off their seats and struck them against the carlings of the upper deck so as to stun them captain pellow however had sufficient presence of mind to fly to the cabin windows and seeing the two hawsers one slack in the bit and the other taut threw himself with an amazing leap which he afterwards said nothing but his sense of danger could have enabled him to take upon the latter and by that means saved himself from the general destruction though his face had been badly cut against the carlings when he was thrown from his seat the first lieutenant saved himself in the same manner by jumping out of the window and by being also a remarkable good swimmer but captain swaffield being as it was supposed more stunned did not escape his body was found on the twenty second of october with his skull fractured appearing to have been crushed between the sides of two vessels the sentinel at the cabin door happened to be looking at his watch how he escaped no one can tell not even himself he was however brought on shore and but little hurt the first thing he felt was that his watch was dashed out of his hands after which he was no longer sensible of what happened to him the boatswain was standing on the cat-head the bowsprit had been stepped for three hours 
the gammoning of everything on and he was directing the men in rigging out the jib boom when suddenly he felt himself driven upwards and fell into the sea he then perceived that he was entangled in the rigging and had some trouble to get clear when being taken up by a boat belonging to one of the men of war they found that his arm was broken one of the surviving seamen declared to an officer of rank that he was preserved in the following truly astonishing manner he was below at the time the amphion blew up and went to the bottom of the ship he recollected that he had a knife in his pocket and taking it out cut his way through the companion of the gun-room which was already shattered with the explosion then letting himself up to the surface of the water he swam unhurt to the shore he showed his knife to the officer and declared he had been under water full five minutes it was likewise said that one of the sailors wives had a young child in her arms the fright of the shock made her take such fast hold of it that though the upper part of her body alone remained the child was found alive locked fast in her arms and likely to do well mr spry an auctioneer who had long lived in great respectability at dock with his son and godson had gone on board to visit a friend and were all lost about half an hour before the frigate blew up one of her lieutenants and lieutenant campbell of the marines and some of the men got into the boat at the dockyard stairs and went off to the ship lieutenant campbell had some business to transact at the marine barracks in the morning and continuing there some time was engaged by the officers to stay to dinner and spend the evening with them some persons however who had in the interval come from the amphion informed lieutenant campbell that there were some letters on board for him as they were some which he was extremely anxious to receive he left the barracks about half an hour before dinner to fetch them intending to return immediately but while he was on board the ship blew up he was a young man universally respected and lamented by the corps as well as by all who knew him one of the lieutenants who lost his life was the only support of an aged mother and sister who at his death had neither friend nor relation left to comfort and protect them the number of people who were afterwards daily seen at dock in deep mourning for their lost relatives was truly melancholy captain pello was taken up by the boats and carried to commissioner fanshawe's house in the dockyard very weak with the exertions he had made and so shocked with the distressing cause of them that he at first appeared scarcely to know where he was or to be sensible of his situation in the course of a day or two when he was a little recovered he was removed to the house of a friend dr hawker of plymouth sir richard king had given a public dinner in honour of the coronation captain charles rowley of the unite frigate calling in the morning was engaged to stay and excused himself from dining as he had previously intended on board the amphion captain darby of the bellerophon was also to have dined with captain pello and had come round in his boat from corsand bay but having to transact some business concerning the ship with sir richard king it detained him half an hour longer at stone house than he expected he had just gone down to the beach and was stepping into the boat to proceed up to hamos when he heard the fatal explosion captain swaffield was to have sailed the next day so that the difference of twenty-four hours would have saved that much lamented and truly valuable officer his brother mr j swaffield of the pay office being asked to the same dinner had set off with him from stone house but before he had reached dock a person came after him upon business which obliged him to return and thus saved him from sharing his brother's untimely fate many conjectures were formed concerning the cause of this catastrophe some conceived it to be owing to neglect as the men were employed in drawing the guns and contrary to rule had not extinguished all the fires though the dinners were over this however the first lieutenant declared to be impossible as they could not be drawing the guns the key of the magazine hanging to his certain knowledge in his cabin at the time some of the men likewise declared that the guns were drawn in the sound before they came up hamoes it was also insinuated that it was done intentionally 
as several of the bodies were afterwards found without clothes as if they had prepared to jump overboard before the ship could have time to blow up as no mutiny had ever appeared in the ship it seems unlikely that such a desperate plot should have been formed without any one who survived having the least knowledge of it it is besides a well-known fact that in almost every case of shipwreck where there is a chance of plunder there are wretches so destitute of the common feeling of humanity as to hover round the scene of horror in hopes by stripping the bodies of the dead and seizing whatever they can lay their hands on to benefit themselves it was the fore magazine which took fire had it been the after one much more damage must have ensued the moment the explosion was heard sir richard king arose from dinner and went in his boat on board the hulk where the sight he beheld was dreadful the deck covered with blood mangled limbs and entrails blackened with gunpowder the shreds of the amphion's pendant and rigging hanging about her and pieces of her shattered timbers strewed all around some people at dinner in the yarmouth though at a very small distance declared that the report they heard did not appear to be louder than the firing of a cannon from the cambridge which they imagined it to be and had never risen from dinner till the confusion upon deck led them to think that some accident had happened at low water the next day about a foot and a half of one of the masts appeared above water and for several days the dockyard men were employed in collecting the shattered masts and yards and dragging out what they could procure from the wreck on the twenty ninth part of the fore chains were hauled shattered and splintered into the head and cut water on the third of october an attempt was made to raise the amphion between the two frigates the castor and iphigenia which were accordingly moored on each side of her but nothing could be got up excepting a few pieces of the ship one or two of her guns some of the men's chests chairs and part of the furniture of the cabin some bodies floated out from between decks and among the rest a midshipman's these and all that could be found were towed round by boats through stonehouse bridge up to the royal hospital stairs to be interred in the burying ground the sight for many weeks was truly dreadful the change of tide washing out the putrid bodies which were towed round by the boats when they would scarcely hold together bodies continued to be found so late as the thirtieth of november when the amphion having been dragged round to another part of the dockyard jetty to be broken up the body of a woman was washed out from between decks a sack was also dragged up containing gunpowder covered over at the top with biscuit and this in some measure confirmed an idea which had before gained ground that the gunner had been stealing powder to sell and had concealed what he could get out by degrees in the above manner and that thinking himself safe on a day when every one was entertaining his friends he had carelessly been among the gunpowder without taking the necessary precautions as he was said to have been seen at dock very much in liquor in the morning it seems probable that this might have been the cause of a calamity as sudden as it was dreadful End of chapter 33「Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy » by Anonymous » Chapter 34 « Loss of HBM Ship La Tribune » off halifax nova scotia la tribune was one of the finest frigates in his majesty's navy mounted forty-four guns and had recently been taken from the french by captain williams in the unicorn frigate she was commanded by captain s barker and on the twenty second of september seventeen ninety seven sailed from torbay as convoy to the quebec and newfoundland fleets in latitude forty nine fourteen and longitude seventeen twenty two she fell in and spoke with his majesty's ship experiment from halifax 
and lost sight of all her convoy on the 10th of October in latitude 74.16 and longitude 32.11. About eight o'clock in the morning of the following Thursday they came in sight of the harbor of Halifax and approached it very fast. With an ESE wind, when Captain Barker proposed to the master to lay the ship to, till they could procure a pilot, the master replied that he had beat a 44 gunship into the harbor, that he had frequently been there, and there was no occasion for a pilot, as the wind was favorable. Confiding in these assurances, Captain Barker went into his cabin, where he was employed in arranging some papers which he intended to take on shore with him. In the meantime, the master, placing great dependence on the judgment of a negro named John Cozy, who had formerly belonged to the Halifax, took upon himself the pilotage of the ship. By twelve o'clock the ship approached so near the thrum cap shoals that the master became alarmed and sent for Mr. Galvin, master's mate, who was sick below. On his coming upon deck, he heard the man in the chain sing out, by the mark five, the black man forward at the same time crying, Steady! Galvin got on one of the carronades to observe the situation of the ship. The master ran in great agitation to the wheel and took it from the man who was steering with the intention of wearing the ship. But before this could be effected, or Galvin was able to give an opinion, she struck. Captain Barker immediately went on deck and reproached the master with having lost the ship. Seeing Galvin likewise on deck, he addressed him and said, that, knowing he had formerly sailed out of the harbor, he was surprised he could stand by and see the master run the ship on shore, to which Galvin replied that he had not been on deck long enough to give an opinion. Signals of distress were immediately made, and answered by the military posts, and ships in the harbor from which as well as the dockyard boats immediately put off to the relief of the tribune the military boats and one of those from the dockyard with mr rackham boatswain of the ordinary reached the ship but the wind was so much against the others that in spite of all their exertions they were unable to get on board the ship was immediately lightened by throwing overboard all her guns excepting one retained for signals, and every other heavy article, so that about half-past eight o'clock in the evening the ship began to heave, and at nine got off the shoals. She had lost her rudder about three hours before, and it was now found on examination that she had seven feet water in the hold. The chain pumps were immediately manned, and such exertions were made that they seemed to gain on the leaks. By the advice of Mr. Rackham, the captain ordered the best bower anchor to be let go, but this did not bring her up. He then ordered the cable to be cut, and the jib and foretop mast stay sail were hoisted to steer by. During this interval, a violent gale, which had come on at S.E., kept increasing and carrying the ship to the western shore. The small bower anchor, which soon afterwards let go, at which time they found themselves in thirteen fathoms of water, and the mizzen mast was then cut away. It was now ten o'clock, and as the water gained fast upon them, the crew had but little hope left of saving either the ship or their lives. At this critical period, Lieutenant Campbell quitted the ship, and Lieutenant North was taken into the boat out of one of the ports. From the moment at which the former left the vessel, all hopes of safety had vanished. The ship was sinking fast. The storm was increasing with redoubled violence, and the rocky shore which they were approaching resounded with the tremendous noise of the rolling billows, presented nothing to those who might survive the loss of the ship, but the expectation of a more painful death by being dashed against precipices, which, even in the calmest day, it is impossible to ascend. Dunlap, one of the survivors, declared 
that about half past ten as nearly as he could conjecture one of the men who had been below came to him on the forecastle and told him it was all over a few minutes afterwards the ship took a lurch like a boat nearly filled with water and going down on which dunlap immediately began to ascend the fore shrouds and at the same moment casting his eyes towards the quarter-deck he saw captain barker standing by the gangway and looking into the water and directly afterwards he heard him call for the jolly boat he then saw the lieutenant of marines running towards the taffrail to look as he supposed for the jolly boat which had been previously let down with men in her but the ship instantly took a second lurch and sank to the bottom after which neither the captain nor any of the other officers were again seen the scene before sufficiently distressing now became peculiarly awful more than two hundred and forty men besides several women and children were floating on the waves making the last effort to preserve life dunlap who has been already mentioned gained the foretop mr galvin the master's mate with incredible difficulty got into the main top he was below when the ship sank directing the men at the chain pump but was washed up the hatchway thrown into the waist and from thence into the water and his feet as he plunged struck against a rock on ascending he swam to gain the main shrouds when three men suddenly seized hold of him he now gave himself up for lost but to disengage himself from them he made a dive into the water which caused them to quit their grasp on rising again he swam to the shrouds and having reached the main top seated himself on an arm chest which was lashed to the mast from the observations of galvin in the main top and dunlap in the foretop it appears that nearly one hundred persons were hanging a considerable time to the shrouds the tops and other parts of the wreck from the length of the night and the severity of the storm nature however became exhausted and during the whole night they kept dropping off and disappeared the cries and groans of the unhappy sufferers from the bruises many of them had received and their hopes of deliverance beginning to fail were continued through the night but as morning approached in consequence of the few who then survived they became extremely feeble about twelve o'clock the mainmast gave way at that time there were on the main top and shrouds about forty persons by the fall of the mast the whole of these unhappy wretches were again plunged into the water and ten only regained the top which rested on the main yard and the whole remained fast to the ship by some of the rigging of the ten men who thus reached the top four only were alive when morning appeared ten were at that time alive on the foretop but three were so exhausted and so helpless that they were washed away before any relief arrived three others perished and thus only four were at last left alive on the foretop the place where the ship went down was barely three times her length to the southward of the entrance into herring cove the inhabitants came down in the night to the point opposite to which the ship sank kept up large fires and were so near as to converse with the people on the wreck the first exertion that was made for their relief was by a boy thirteen years old from herring cove who ventured off in a small skiff by himself about eleven o'clock the next day this youth with great labor and extreme risk to himself boldly approached the wreck and backed in his little boat so near to the foretop as to take off two of the men for the boat could not with safety hold any more and here a trait of generous magnanimity was exhibited which ought not to pass unnoticed dunlop and another man named monroe had throughout this disastrous night preserved their strength and spirits in a greater degree than their unfortunate companions who they endeavored to cheer and encourage when they found their spirits sinking 
Upon the arrival of the boat, these two might have stepped into it, and thus have terminated their own sufferings, for their two companions, though alive, were unable to stir. They lay exhausted in the top, wishing not to be disturbed, and seemed desirous to perish in that situation. These generous fellows hesitated not a moment to remain themselves on the wreck, and to save their unfortunate companions against their will. They lifted them up, and with the greatest exertion placed them in the boat, the manly boy, rowed them triumphantly to the cove, and immediately had them conveyed to a comfortable habitation. After shaming by his example older persons who had larger boats, he again put off with his skiff, but with all his efforts he could not then approach the wreck. His example, however, was soon followed by four of the crew who had escaped in the Tribune's jolly boat, and by some of the boats in the cove. With their joint exertions the eight men were preserved, and these with the four who had saved themselves in the jolly boat were the whole of the survivors of this fine ship's company. A circumstance occurred in which that cool thoughtlessness of danger, which so often distinguishes our British tars, was displayed in such a striking manner that it would be inexcusable to omit it. Daniel Monroe had, as we have already seen, gained the foretop. He suddenly disappeared, and it was concluded that he had been washed away, like many others. After being absent from the top about two hours, he, to the surprise of Dunlap, who was likewise on the foretop, raised his head through the lubber hole. Dunlap, inquiring where he had been, he told him he had been cruising for a better berth, that after swimming about the wreck for a considerable time, he had returned to the fore shrouds and crawling in on the catharpins, had actually been sleeping there more than an hour, and appeared greatly refreshed. End of chapter 34《Chapter 35 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy》by Anonymous Chapter 35 Burning of the Prince, a French East Indiaman on the 19th of February, 1752, a French East Indiaman called the Prince sailed from Port Lorient on a voyage outward bound. But soon afterwards, a sudden shift of wind drove her on a sandbank where she was exposed to imminent danger and healed so much that the mouths of the guns lay in the sea. By lightening the ship, however, accompanied by incessant and laborious exertions, she floated with the rise of the tide and, being again carried into port, was completely unloaded and underwent a thorough repair. The voyage was resumed on the 10th of June, with a favourable wind, and for several weeks seemed to promise every success that could be desired. While in south latitude, 8.30, and in 5 west longitude from Paris, Monsieur de la Fonde, one of the lieutenants of the ship, was just at the moment of this observation informed by a seaman that smoke was issuing from the main hatchway. The first lieutenant, who had the keys of the hold, immediately ordered every hatchway to be opened to ascertain the truth. But the fact was too soon verified, and while the captain hastened on deck from the great cabin where he sat at dinner, Lieutenant de la Fonde ordered some sails to be dipped in the sea, and the hatches to be covered with them in order to prevent the access of air and thus stifle the fire. He had even intended as a more effectual measure to let in the water between decks to the depth of a foot, but clouds of smoke issued from the crevices of the hatchways and the flames gained more and more by degrees. Meantime, the captain ordered sixty or eighty soldiers under arms to restrain any disorder and confusion which might probably ensue, and in this he was supported by their commander, Monsieur de la Touche, who exhibited uncommon fortitude on the occasion. 
every one was now employed in procuring water all the buckets were filled the pumps plied and pipes introduced from them to the hold but the rapid progress of the flames baffled the exertions to subdue them and augmented the general consternation the yawl lying in the way of the people was hoisted out by order of the captain and the boatswain along with three others took possession of it wanting oars they were supplied with some by three men who leaped overboard those in the ship however desired them to return but they exclaimed that they wanted a rudder and desired a rope to be thrown out however the progress of the flames soon showing them the only alternative for safety they withdrew from the ship and she from the effect of a breeze springing up passed by on board the utmost activity still prevailed and the courage of the people seemed to be augmented by the difficulty of escape the master boldly went down into the hold but the intense heat compelled him to return and had not a quantity of water been dashed over him he would have been severely scorched immediately subsequent to this period flames violently burst from the main hatchway at that time the captain ordered the boats to be got out while consternation enfeebled the most intrepid the long boat had been secured at a certain height and she was about to be put over the ship's side when unhappily the fire ran up the main mast and caught the tackle the boat fell down on the guns bottom upwards and it was vain to think of getting her righted at length it became too evident that the calamity was beyond the reach of human remedy nothing but the mercy of the almighty could interpose consternation was universally disseminated among the people nothing but sighs and groans resounded through the vessel and the very animals on board as if sensible of the impending danger uttered the most dreadful cries the certainty of perishing in either element was anticipated by every human being here and each raised his heart and hands towards heaven the chaplain who was now on the quarter-deck gave the people general absolution for their sins and then repaired to the quarter-gallery to extend it yet further to those miserable wretches who in hopes of safety had already committed themselves to the waves what a horrible spectacle self-preservation was the only object each was occupied in throwing overboard whatever promised the most slender chance of escape yards spars hen coops and everything occurring was seized in despair and thus employed dreadful confusion prevailed some leaped into the sea anticipating that death which was about to reach them others more successful swam to fragments of the wreck while the shrouds yards and ropes along the side of the vessel were covered with the crew crowding upon them and hanging there as if hesitating which alternative of destruction to choose equally imminent and equally terrible a father was seen to snatch his son from the flames fold him to his breast and then throwing him into the sea himself followed where they perished in each other's embrace Meantime, Lieutenant Fond ordered the helm to be shifted. The ship heeled to larboard, which afforded temporary preservation, while the fire raged along the starboard from stem to stern. Lieutenant Fond had, until this moment, been engrossed by nothing but adopting every means to preserve the ship. Now, however, the horrors of impending destruction were too conspicuously in view his fortitude notwithstanding through the goodness of heaven never forsook him looking around he found himself alone on the deck and he retired to the roundhouse there he met monsieur de la touche who regarded the approach of death with the same heroism which in india had gained him celebrity my brother and friend he cried farewell whither are you going asked lieutenant fond to comfort my friend the captain he replied monsieur morin who commanded this unfortunate vessel stood overwhelmed with grief for the melancholy state of his female relatives passengers along with him he had persuaded them to commit themselves to the waves on hen coops 
while some of the seamen, swimming with one hand, endeavoured to support them with the other. The floating masts and yards were covered with men, struggling with the watery element, many of whom now perished by balls discharged from the guns as heated by the fire, and thus presenting a third means of destruction, augmenting the horrors environing them. While anguish pierced the heart of Monsieur de la Fond, he withdrew his eyes from the sea, and a moment after, reaching the starboard gallery, he saw the flames bursting with frightful noise through the windows of the round house and of the great cabin. The fire approached and was ready to consume him. Considering it vain to attempt the further preservation of the ship or the lives of his fellow sufferers, he thought it his duty in this dreadful condition to save himself yet a few hours, that these might be devoted to heaven. Stripping off his clothes, he designed slipping down a yard, one end of which dipped in the water. But it was so covered with miserable beings, shrinking from death, that he tumbled over them and fell into the sea. There a drowning soldier caught hold of him. Lieutenant Fond made every exertion to disengage himself, but in vain. He even allowed himself to sink below the surface, yet he did not quit his grasp. Lieutenant Fond plunged down a second time. Still he was firmly held by the man, who then was incapable of considering that his death, instead of being of service, would rather hasten his own. At last, after struggling a considerable time and swallowing a great quantity of water, the soldier's strength failed and sensible that Monsieur de la Fond was sinking a third time, he dreaded to be carried down along with him, and loosened his grasp. No sooner was this done than Monsieur de la Fond, to guard against a repetition, dived below the surface and rose at a distance from the place. This incident rendered him more cautious for the future. He even avoided the dead bodies, now so numerous that to make a free passage he was compelled to shove them aside with one hand while he kept himself floating with the other. For he was impressed with the apprehension that each was a person who would seize him and involve him in his own destruction. But strength beginning to fail, he was satisfied of the necessity of some respite when he fell in with a part of the ensign staff. He put his arm through a noose of the rope to secure it and swam as well as he could. Then, perceiving a yard at hand, he seized it by one end. However, beholding a young man, scarce able to support himself at the other extremity, he quickly abandoned so slight an aid, and one which seemed incapable of contributing to his own preservation. Next, the spritsail yard appeared in view, but covered with people, among whom he durst not take a place without requesting permission, which they cheerfully granted. Some were quite naked, others in nothing except their shirts. The pity they expressed at the situation of Monsieur de la Fond and his sense of their misfortunes exposed his feelings to a severe trial. Neither Captain Morin nor Monsieur de la Touche ever quitted the ship and were most probably overwhelmed in the catastrophe by which she was destroyed. But the most dismal spectacle was exhibited on all sides, the main mast, consumed below, had been precipitated overboard, killing some in the fall and affording a temporary reception to others. Monsieur de la Fond now observed it covered with people, driven about by the waves, and at the same time, seeing two seamen buoyed up by a hen-coop and some planks, desired them to swim to him with the latter. They did so, accompanied by more of their comrades and each taking a plank which were used for oars, they and he paddled along upon the yard, until gaining those who had secured themselves on the main mast. So many alternations only presented new spectacles of horror. The chaplain was at this time on the mast, and from him Monsieur de la Fond received absolution. Two young ladies were also there, whose piety and resignation were truly consolatory, they were the only survivors of six. Their companions had perished in the flames or in the sea. Eighty persons had found refuge on the main mast, 
who from the repeated discharge of cannon from the ship according to the progress of the flames were constantly exposed to destruction the chaplain in this awful condition by his discourse and example taught the duty of resignation monsieur de la fond observing him lose his hold on the mast and drop into the sea lifted him up let me go he said i am already half drowned and it is only protracting my sufferings no my friend the lieutenant replied when my strength is exhausted not till then we will perish together and in his pious presence he calmly awaited death after remaining here three hours he beheld one of the ladies fall from the mast and perish she was too remote to receive any assistance from him but when least in expectation of it he saw the yawl close at hand at five in the afternoon he cried to the men that he was their lieutenant and requested to be allowed to participate in their fate his presence was too necessary for them to refuse his solicitations they needed a conductor who might guide them to the land thus they permitted him to come on board on condition that he should swim to the yawl this was a reasonable stipulation it was to avoid approaching the mast else the rest actuated by the same desire of self-preservation would soon have overloaded the little vessel and all would have been buried in a watery grave monsieur de la fond therefore summoning up all his strength and courage was so happy as to reach the seamen in a little time afterwards the pilot and master whom he had left on the mast followed his example and swimming towards the yawl were seen and taken in the flame still continued raging in the vessel and as the yawl was still endangered by being within half a league of her she stood a little to windward not long subsequent to this the fire reached the magazine and then to describe the thundering explosion which ensued is impossible a thick cloud intercepted the light of the sun and amidst the terrific darkness nothing but pieces of flaming timber projected aloft into the air could be seen threatening to crush to atoms in their fall numbers of miserable wretches still struggling with the agonies of death nor were the party in the yawl beyond the reach of hazard it was not improbable that some of the fiery fragments might come down upon them and precipitate their frail support to the bottom though the almighty preserved them from that shocking calamity they were shocked with the spectacle environing them the vessel had now disappeared the sea to a great distance was covered with pieces of the wreck intermingled with the bodies of those unhappy creatures who had perished by their fall some were seen who had been choked others mangled half consumed and still retaining life enough to be sensible of the accumulated horrors overwhelming them the fortitude of monsieur de la fond was still preserved through the favour of heaven and he proposed approaching the wreck to see whether any provisions or necessary articles might be picked up he and his companions being totally devoid of everything were exposed to the hazard of a death even more painful than that which the others had suffered in perishing of famine but finding several barrels which they hoped might contain something to relieve their necessities they experienced great mortification on ascertaining that they were part of the powder that had been thrown overboard during the conflagration of the unfortunate vessel as night approached they providentially discovered a cask of brandy about fifteen pounds of salt pork a piece of scarlet cloth twenty yards of linen a dozen of pipe staves and a small quantity of cordage when it became dark they durst not venture to retain their present station until daylight without being endangered by the wreck from the fragments of which they had not then been able to disengage themselves therefore they rowed as quickly away as possible from among them and bent all their care to the management of the yawl the whole began to labour assiduously and every article which could be converted to use was employed the lining of the boat was tore up for the sake of the planks and nails a seaman luckily had two needles 
and the linen afforded whatever thread was necessary. The piece of scarlet cloth was substituted for a sail, an oar was erected for a mast, and a plank served for a rudder. The equipment of the boat was soon completed, notwithstanding the darkness of the night, at least as well as circumstances would allow. Yet a great difficulty remained for wanting charts and instruments, and being nearly two hundred leagues from land, the party felt at a loss what course to steer. Resigning themselves to the Almighty, they offered up fervent prayers for his direction. At length, the sail was hoisted, and a favourable breeze soon wafted Monsieur de la Font from amidst the bodies of his miserable comrades. Eight days and nights, the adventurers advanced without seeing land. Naked and exposed to the scorching heat of the sun by day and to intense cold by night, but to relieve the thirst which parched them, they availed themselves of a shower of rain falling on the sixth, and tried to catch a little of it in their mouths and with their hands. They sucked the sail, which was wet with the rain, but from being previously drenched with sea water, it imparted a bitterness to the fresh water which it received. However, they did not complain for had the rain been heavier, it might have lulled the wind, in the continuance of which they rested their hopes of safety. In order to ascertain the proper course, the adventurers paid daily observance to the rising and setting of the sun and moon, and the position of the stars pointed out how they should steer. All their sustenance in the meantime was a small piece of pork, once in twenty-four hours and this they were even obliged to relinquish on the fourth day from the heat and irritation it occasioned of their bodies. Their beverage was a glass of brandy taken from time to time, but it inflamed their stomachs without assuaging the thirst that consumed them. Abundance of flying fish were seen, the impossibility of catching any of which only augmented the pain already endured though Monsieur de la Fond and his companions tried to reconcile themselves to the scanty pittance that they possessed. Yet the uncertainty of their destiny, the want of substance and the turbulence of the ocean all contributed to deprive them of repose, which they so much required, and almost plunged them in despair. Nothing but a feeble ray of hope preserved them under the accumulated sufferings. The eighth night was passed by Monsieur de la Fond at the helm. There he had remained above ten hours, after soliciting relief, and at last sunk down under fatigue. His miserable companions were equally exhausted, and despair began to overwhelm the whole. At last, when the united calamities of hunger, thirst, fatigue, and misery predicted speedy annihilation, the dawn of Wednesday, the 3rd of August, showed this unfortunate crew the distant land. None but those who have experienced the like situation can form any adequate idea of the change which was produced. Their strength was renovated, and they were aroused to precautions against being drifted away by the current. They reached the coast of Brazil, in latitude 6 south, and entered Tresson Bay. The first object of Monsieur de la Font and his companions was to return thanks for the gracious protection of heaven. They prostrated themselves on the ground, and then, in the transport of joy, rolled among the sand. They exhibited the most frightful appearance. Nothing human characterized them, which did not announce their misfortune in glaring colors. Some were quite naked, others had only shirts rotten and torn to rags. Monsieur de la Font had fastened a piece of the scarlet cloth about his waist in order to appear at the head of his companions. Though rescued from imminent danger, they had still to contend with hunger and thirst, and remained in ignorance whether they should meet men endowed with humanity in that region. While deliberating on the course they should follow, about fifty Portuguese of the settlement, there established, advanced and inquired the cause of their presence. Their misfortunes were soon explained, 
and the recital of them proved a sufficient claim for supplying their wants deeply affected by the account now given the portuguese congratulated themselves that it had fallen to their lot to relieve the strangers and speedily led them to their dwellings on the way the seamen were rejoiced at the sight of a river into which they threw themselves plunging in the water and drinking copious draughts of it to allay their thirst afterwards frequent bathing proved one of the best restoratives of health to which they all resorted the chief man of the place next came and conducted monsieur de la fond and his companions to his house about half a league distant from the spot where they landed he charitably supplied them with linen shirts and trousers and boiled some fish the water of which was relished as delicious broth though sleep was equally necessary as this frugal fare the survivors having learnt that there was a church within half a league dedicated to saint michael repaired thither to render thanks to heaven for their miraculous preservation the badness of the road induced such fatigue as compelled them to rest in the village where it stood and there the narrative of their misfortunes added to the piety which they exhibited attracted the notice of the inhabitants all of whom hastened to minister something to their necessities after remaining a short interval they returned to their host who at night kindly contributed another repast of fish something more invigorating however being required by people who had endured so much they purchased an ox for a quantity of the brandy that had been saved from the wreck paraibo was distant fifteen leagues and they had to set out barefoot and with little chance of finding suitable provisions on the journey thus they smoke dried their present store and added a little flour to it in three days they began to march and under an escort of three soldiers advanced seven leagues the first day when they were hospitably received by a person and passed the night in his house on the following evening a sergeant and twenty-nine men arrived to conduct them to the commandant of the fortress who gave them a friendly reception afforded them supplies and provided a boat to carry them to paraibo about midnight they reached the town where a portuguese captain attended to present them to the governor from whom also they experienced the like attention being anxious to reach fernambuc to take advantage of a portuguese fleet daily expected to sail for europe the governor in three days more ordered a corporal to conduct the party thither but at this time monsieur de la fond's feet were so cruelly wounded he was scarce able to stand and on that account was supplied with a horse in four days he arrived at fernambuc where from different naval and military officers he met with the utmost attention and consideration he and all his companions got a passage to europe in the fleet monsieur de la fond sailed on the fifth of october and reached lisbon in safety on the seventeenth of december thence he procured a passage to morlaix where having rested a few days to recruit his strength he repaired to port l'orient with his health greatly injured by the calamities he had suffered and reduced to a state of poverty having after twenty-eight years service lost all he had in the world by this deplorable catastrophe nearly three hundred persons perished End of chapter thirty five Chapter thirty six of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter thirty six Wreck of the Schooner Betsy on a reef of rocks the betsy a small schooner of about seventy-five tons burden sailed from macao in china for new south wales on the tenth of november eighteen hundred five her complement consisted of william brooks commander edward luttrell mate one portuguese sea cunny 
three manila and four chinese lascars no incident worthy of commemoration happened from the tenth to the twentieth of november next day when the vessel was going at the rate of seven knots and a half an hour she struck on a reef of rocks at half past two in the morning while in north latitude nine forty eight and one hundred fourteen fourteen east longitude the boat was instantly let down and a small anchor sent astern but on heaving the cable parted and both were lost the people next endeavored to construct a raft of the water casks but the swell proved so great that they found it impossible to accomplish their purpose at daybreak they found that the vessel had forged four or five miles on the reef which they now discovered extended nine or ten miles to the south and four or five east and west and there were only two feet water where she lay during three days and nights the utmost exertions were made to get her off without avail and the crew had then become so weakened that they could scarce be persuaded to construct a raft the vessel now had bulged on the starboard side but a raft being made on the twenty fourth the people left her with the jolly boat in company and steered for balambangan captain brooks the mate the gunner and two sea cunnies were in the latter where their whole provision consisted of only a small bag of biscuit and on the raft were the portuguese four chinese and three malays but much better provided the boat and the raft parted company on the same day as a brisk gale arose from the westward and the raft was never heard of more but it was conjectured to have probably drifted on the island of borneo which then bore southeast the gale continued from the northwest until the twenty eighth of the month accompanied by a mountainous sea and then ceased by this time the fresh water taken into the boat was completely expended and all the biscuit that remained was wet with salt water on the twenty ninth at daybreak land came into view which was supposed to be balabac the people were now nearly exhausted by rowing under a burning sun and while a perfect calm prevailed and they were besides reduced to such extremity as to drink their own urine it blew so hard in the night that they were obliged to bear up for bangay the northwest point of which they discovered next morning at daybreak going ashore they instantly made a search for fresh water which they soon found and considering what they had suffered from thirst it is no wonder that they drank to excess while rambling into the woods in quest of fruit two malays met them to whom they made signs that they wanted food and these being understood the malays went away and in the afternoon returned with two coconuts and a few sweet potatoes which they gave in exchange for a silver spoon night approaching the people returned to their boat next morning five malays made their appearance bringing some indian corn and potatoes which were exchanged for spoons as before these people pointed to balambangan and endeavoured to make the party comprehend that some time ago the english had abandoned the settlement a new supply of provision was promised next morning therefore the party retired with their little stock and attended at the appointed time to receive more eleven malays then appeared on the beach but after a little conversation on landing one of them threw a spear at captain brooks which penetrated his belly another made a cut at mr luttrell who parried it off with a cutlass and ran to the boat captain brooks withdrew the spear from his body and also ran a short distance but the inhuman assassins followed him and cut off both his legs the gunner also was severely wounded and reached the boat covered with blood while the party at the same time saw the malays stripping the dead body of captain brooks and in about fifteen minutes afterwards the gunner expired the survivors immediately made sail and then examined into the state of their provisions which they found consisted of ten cobs of indian corn three pumpkins and two bottles of water trusting to the mercy of providence they with this determined on shaping their course for the straits of malacca no particular occurrence happened in the course of the voyage from the fourth to the fourteenth of december frequent showers had fortunately supplied them with fresh water but they were nearly exhausted by constant watching and hunger on the fifteenth they fell in with a group of islands 
in three of north latitude and about one hundred degrees of east longitude and approached the shore but being descried by two malay prows they were immediately attacked and one of the sea cunnies was run through with a spear and died instantly while the other was also wounded mr luttrell the mate had a very narrow escape from a spear piercing through his hat the party being thus overpowered the malays took possession of their boat and immediately seized on all their property a sextant their log-book some plate and clothes they were themselves kept in a prow without any covering and exposed to the scorching heat of the sun with an allowance of only a small amount of sago during three days after that time they were carried ashore to the house of a rajah on an island called suba where they remained in a state of slavery entirely naked and subsisting on sago until the twentieth of april the rajah sailed on that day in a prow for rio taking mr luttrell and the two other survivors along with him and arrived there nearly famished after a tedious passage of twenty-five days here their distresses were alleviated by mr coke of malacca who treated them in the kindest manner and the ship candree commanded by captain williamson arriving next day they obtained a passage in her for malacca End of chapter 36